So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, the climate emergency in Scotland and what we can do about it. Um, I could give a science talk about um, all the things, all the science of climate change, but I'll just give you a little introduction at the beginning to the science, but then I'll focus the rest on what we can do about it as individuals. Because um, I'm often asked, you know, it, it seems like such a big problem. Is there anything that we as individuals can do about it? Surely it's only governments and big industry that have to play a role. But in fact, uh, we can all um, make a difference to climate change. And that's the main point that I aim to get across in this evening's talk. So the first thing to note is that climate change has really shifted up the agenda. So um, everybody's talking about it. Um, uh, until COVID came along, it was probably the most talked about thing um, uh, in the news. Um, and these are just a few of the headlines that have appeared uh, just over recently on uh, on climate change. It's all, all in the media. Uh, you see about you see about it on the news um, all the time. Um, and it's uh, particularly important for us, as as Pat said, we've got the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. COP26, which will be in Glasgow this year. So it's particularly on our minds in Scotland and in the UK at the moment. Climate change uh, is, is an existential threat. It's something that is gonna affect all of us. It's something that is affecting all of us. Um, when I started talking about um, these issues 20 years ago, we were still trying to, um, trying to persuade the skeptics um, and people who thought that it wasn't happening. Uh, the world's moved on really um, and uh, people are wanting to make change, governments are wanting to make change, uh, many governments have committed towards uh, towards net, net zero targets, so the world is moving on despite what um, some people may think about whether it's real or not. So the, the vast consensus of science uh, scientific expertise says it is happening, it is, uh, it is produced by humans and uh, and the world needs to move swiftly um, to tackle it. So if we look at this, this slide was produced um, uh, about six years ago, um, and you can see that these are the climate change effects around the world, um, which include um, animals and fish being affected, floods, rising sea levels, sea, uh, sea, level, sea level, water shortages, crop changes, melting ice and wildfires. And if you just have a look where this is, you can see Australia and uh, the west coast of, um, of the US, uh, showing up as particularly important for wildfires and uh, you know since this slide was made there's been the devastating wildfires in Australia and those occurring uh, down the uh, down the uh, western seaboard of the US uh, currently um, in Canada and California and such like. We've also seen um, floods, devastating floods in Europe which are predicted um, on this map um, we've seen crop failures and, and changes in, in, in and famines uh, resulting from crop failures across the globe and also changes, um, uh, change, uh, impacts on biodiversity, um, fishes and animals, which are occurring all around the world. So this hotspot map that was produced um, uh, in 2014, um, you can see what's, what's come to pass and all of those um, issues we're actually seeing now. So climate change isn't something that's gonna affect us in the future. It's something that is affecting us now, it's very real now. Um, if we look at the climate change impacts, um, according to NASA, um, we are um, expected to experience more frequent and stronger heat waves. And the Met Office just last week um, issued its first heat wave, um, a, a weather warning for uh, heat waves, and that's going to become more prevalent in the future. Heat waves are no longer going to be something that we look forward to. They're going to be something that we um, that we have to take care uh, to avoid the worst excesses of. People die in heat waves. Um, many thousands died in the European heat wave, and uh, we've had a number of deaths in the UK from uh, recent heat waves. Um, there are more storms project, more projected to occur, more floods, such as those that we've just seen in, uh, in Germany last week, more droughts and more famines. There's projected to be about a one metre sea level rise by 2100. That's a blink of an eye in geological time. Uh, and we could see a, a rise of, you know, one metre. Uh, that's an that's incredible amount. And that could uh, affect many of our coastal communities even within the lifetimes of some of the people on this call. 
um, we'll see more pests and diseases and we could be seeing an ice free Arctic in the summer before the mid century. There are a number of risks and uh, sh shown over on the right hand side of the slide are just some of the risks. So we got risks to unique and threatened uh, systems. So these uh, kick in, these risks become uh, prevalent after only about one degree uh, rise in temperature. And as we move through this graph, we've got some of the things which become a higher risk as we get into higher temperatures. But as you can see from this graph, around two degrees Celsius is when we really start getting into all of the high risks uh, in all of the risk categories. So um, the, the limit was set in the Paris Agreement that we must not uh, exceed uh, two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, with with um, and the Paris Agreement also says that we should make every effort to limit uh, climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. For any of you who um, uh, are still um, not convinced about climate change, uh, these are the global average temperatures plotted out from 1850 to um, the most recent year, 2020, for which data is available for the full year. And as you can see, we've had this large rise, particularly from the 1960s and 70s um, through the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, up to 2020, we've had this inexorable rise. And global temperatures are linked to um, and driven by changes in global greenhouse gas emissions, which I'll come on to in a moment. This is just a graph that shows you, um, it plots the five year average from 1880 up to the pres present time. I'll just show this little animation because this shows how temperatures is, have changed globally. So what you can see is the blue areas are below the long term average and the yellow and red areas are above the long term average. So this is, um, you can have a look at this. This is freely available on the NASA website. Um, and I'll just set the, set the video going now so that you can see it. So as we start off in the 1800s, we got a small area in South Africa there, but that disappears. So you're just seeing it's fairly blue and we get some uh, yellow and uh, red patches occurring. It, it heats up around about the time of the um, uh, Second World War, but that doesn't last. Look what kicks in after um, 1970. From 1970 onwards, uh, the map goes entirely red. And that's taken us up to the present time. And you can see there's hardly any blue areas, though be those below the long term average, and many, many, area, many, many areas that are yellow and red, which show that we're above the long term average. And to look at that in a different way, the next slide just shows um, what's called the, the, the barcode of climate change. All this is, is every year since uh, 18, uh, 1830, uh, I can't, can't see that, I can't see the top of my slide. Um, I can't remember which year it is, up to 2020. So each year is ordered just by, on, the, on the year that it occurred. And the color of the stripe represents, uh, blue is below the long-term average with dark blues quite a lot below and light blue just a bit below. And the red areas are uh, the ones that are above the long-term average. And what you can see here is a very clear warm, warming uh, towards the right-hand side of the graph it's much more red than it is blue. Uh, it was blue at the beginning, but it's gradually turned uh, red, particularly from about 1970 onwards. And as I mentioned, this is driven largely by changes in greenhouse gas concentrations. So this is the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere um, that's taken from the, the Keeling curve, so-called Keeling curve, which shows that the uh, greenhouse gas concentration of the atmosphere is now consistently above 400 parts per million. Now, when I started giving lectures on climate change in round about 2000, I looked back at some of the slides that I was using and I was saying we're now up to about 360 parts per million. And if we're not careful, we're going to reach 400 parts per million uh, within, a, within a decade or so. And that is, in fact, what has happened because we failed to tackle climate change. We failed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. This is for carbon dioxide, um, and that's uh, recorded um, in the atmosphere. You can see the sawtooth there, which is showing the, um, the, the Earth breathing, if you like, the northern hemisphere absorbing the CO2. There's a larger landmass in the northern hemisphere, and in the northern hemisphere summer, it draws down carbon dioxide as it's fixed by photosynthesis, and in the winter, that CO2 is released. 
and that gives this this sawtooth which is actually the earth breathing but what you can see is the long term average is increasing year on year on year and it's not only carbon dioxide and it's not only recently that we've seen these issues we can follow it back by looking at the um, gas trapped in ice cores and this is uh, going from 10,000 years ago up until the present time and what you can see is for 10,000 years the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere remains relatively stable and then when the industrial revolution occurs we get this massive increase and the blow up of it is shown over here in the inset which shows from about 1800s onwards up to 1900 you get a gradual increase and then a rapid increase in carbon dioxide um, concentrations in the atmosphere and we get a similar pattern for the other two main biogenic greenhouse gases nitrous oxide which is again a lot more fluctuation but relatively stable um, in the long-term average over the last 10,000 years but a massive increase in nitrous oxide emissions um, since the industrial revolution and the same with methane relatively flat but a massive increase in industrial since the industrial revolution so we've been putting all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere we know that they trap um, the heat so the incoming radiation can get through the atmosphere but these gases trap the heat within the atmosphere so we understand the physics perfectly well so we would be surprised actually if we didn't see an increase in temperature knowing these increasing concentrations so there really is no doubt about the causal link between our emission of greenhouse gases and the rise in temperature and the climate change that we are experiencing so how long is it before we um, surpass 1.5 degrees? So 1.5 degrees was this aspirational target that's in the Paris Agreement that's going to be talked about again in Glasgow um, uh, this November when the Conference of Parties meets again. Um, but we're looking back to this target, which was set a target to try and limit um, global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times. The bad news is that global temperatures have already warmed by 1.2 degrees Celsius since the pre-industrial times, since the Industrial Revolution. So we've only got about 0.3 degrees until we reach that target. At the current rate of emissions, we'll exceed the 1.5 degree warming target within about 5 to 12 years. And those were Met Office and IPCC estimates that were made three years ago. More recent estimates from the World Meteorological Organization suggest um, that one in, we have a one in four chance that the world will exceed that target of 1.5 degrees for at least one year um, by 2025. So we're already pushing up against that limit. That's why we're in a state of climate emergency. We currently emit about 1,332 tonnes of carbon dioxide every second. Greenhouse gas emission reductions need to be immediate and extremely aggressive. So the UK, Scotland and many other countries have declared a climate emergency. We're not just calling it climate change anymore. We recognise that we're in a climate emergency and that we need to address it as such with urgency. So what can we do about it? So we can tackle it in a number of ways. So if we look at this graph, the, the yellow line shows the business as usual emissions. Um, we currently emit around about 50 gigatons of CO2 per year. That's 1,000 million tonnes. So 50,000 million tonnes of greenhouse gases per year. Um, that has gone up to around uh, a, a bit higher by 2020. And under business as usual, that will continue to rise until about 2060. The problem is we don't have that long to wait. We can't uh, wait for business as usual and for those uh, greenhouse gas emissions to come down by themselves. We have to uh, make that happen. So to stay below 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, which is shown on the red line, we need a mix of measures. So shown in the light green here are the conven conventional abatement technologies. So this is basically swapping out our energy generation, our fossil fuels, with renewable energy and perhaps some nuclear, um, which don't emit CO2. So we can go so far just by changing the way that we use fossil fuels, uh, by reducing our use of fossil fuels. But we're still going to have some emitting technologies even up to 2050. 
So there are things like nitrous oxide emissions and methane emissions from agriculture. We have to eat, we can't stop doing agriculture, and there's going to be some emissions of greenhouse gases coming from agriculture. So as well as these conventional abatement technologies, we're going to need something to offset or to mop up these remaining difficult to abate emissions, for example, those from uh, those from agriculture and possibly those from continued use of fossil fuels in aviation. So we need carbon remo remo removal technologies. I'm not going to talk too much about those today, apart from the nature based solutions for carbon removal. So that's things like forestry and peatland restoration, which absorb CO2 from the atmosphere and it can lock up that carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's a negative emission technology which can offset those remaining emissions. And we know that we're going to need some of those carbon removal options and a rapid and aggressive move away from fossil fuels to more towards renewables. And because we've got these emitting technologies still emitting, we need the negative emission technologies to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere to allow us to stay on this trajectory of staying below two degrees Celsius or even better under 1.5 degrees Celsius. So what are we going to do about it in the UK and Scotland? So firstly, where do our emissions come from in Scotland? These are the latest figures for which we, uh, the latest uh, figures that we have for the year 2018. It takes a while to put these together, so it's a couple of years behind. But these are the latest Scottish government figures um, for where our emissions come from. So you can see that about 5% of our emissions are from energy supply. That's greatly changed over the last 10 years as we've transitioned away um, from fossil fuels. And we're now driving most of our electricity generation from uh, renewables. So that only accounts for 5%. Transport as proportion has increased up to 36% of our emissions. So a switch away from uh, fossil fuels to power our vehicles through the internal combustion engine and a move towards electric, which you can generate from renewables, will be a big step in the right direction for decarbonizing transport, as well as the possibility for hydrogen, maybe uh, for some uh, larger vehicles and fleet vehicles. Our industrial processes account for nearly 30%, 28% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture has remained steady at around about 18% of our emissions, mainly from nitrous oxide, from fertilizer, and from methane production, mainly from cattle uh, in our agricultural sector. Our buildings account for 23% of our emissions. Waste only 4%, but still a little bit. And you can see that forestry has got a minus figure here. That's because our forestry is currently absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere as it grows. Um, so that is contributing to removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that, if you like, is our existing negative emission technology. So that's what we that's where our emissions come from as a country. So what can we do about reducing them? In order to address it, um, we've had a number of acts um, in the UK and in Scotland, which are um, world leading in, in their ambition and in their um, in their targets. So the Climate Change Act in the UK um, set out an emission reduction target of 42 percent by 2020 and 80 percent by 2050. The Climate Change Act Scotland 2009 set out similar targets, so 40% uh, by 2020 and 80% by 2050. But this has since been superseded by the Climate Change Emission Reduction Targets Scotland Act of 2019, which sets the UK a target of net zero emissions by 2050. And for Scotland, which has already declared a climate emergency, as I mentioned, net zero emissions by 2045. So that means we need to cut all of our emissions to zero and those that we can't cut to zero, we need to, um, we need to have negative, negative, um, uh, negative emissions technologies or greenhouse gas removal by things like uh, planting forests or peatland restoration to suck up that remaining carbon. I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later. For the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about what we can do about it as individuals, because I'm frequently asked about this, about what can we do about it? People want to know what individual contribution they can make in their everyday lives to reducing climate change and to playing their part 
in getting us towards net zero. So here are a few ideas about things that we can do, which I'm going to talk about some of them in a little more detail. Um, and then we'll come back. So I'll show a little video at the end, which just summarizes all of this information. So some options that can reduce our climate footprint, um, working from home more, if you can. I think uh, uh, COVID, the COVID crisis has been a dreadful, a terrible thing, but has shown us that the world doesn't stop turning when more people work from home. So for people that can work from home, um, uh, they, they do work from home. And I think that home working will increase uh, in the future. There's been a suggestion uh, that it could in, uh, working from home could increase by 550 percent after the UK lockdown lifts. That's the first lockdown. Um, and already a number of com companies and organisations are introducing work from home policies where you can work at least one day or a few days from home uh, so that we don't need to take that. Uh, journey into the office when it's not necessary when, when we can do that work at home. So the University of Aberdeen, for example, who I work for, has introduced a, a new policy, a work from home policy, where people can opt into to working from home when it suits them. You can also use active transport or take public transport whenever you can. By active transport, I just mean walk and bike on short journeys whenever you can or to car share or to use public transport. The less we use our private vehicles, the less impact we have on the environment. We can fly less or not at all. So I used to fly all over the world before the COVID, COVID pandemic. I used to have the worst climate footprint, I think, of anybody in the university through attending meetings, even though I was telling people um, that we needed to tackle climate change. So um, hypocrisy is called out there. Um, but I've learned over the pandemic um, that I can do a lot of the business and a lot of the meetings that we've had uh, by, um, by Zoom and by Teams, the way that we're meeting tonight. On some occasions, there's no, there's no, um, there's no better, better way to meet than, than in person. And I think maybe you're looking forward to getting back to your regular meetings in person where you can see and talk and hear these things live. Um, but for some of the meetings, uh, you know, we don't need to fly to Europe uh, for a two hour meeting and then fly back again. We can do that quite adequately um, using electronic media. So the emissions, global emissions dropped by about 17% at their peak, but um, already now they're back up to just 5% below normal. And the emissions for this year are projected to um, fall back onto the same trajectory as we were on before. So even though we've had a brief blip in emissions, um, uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, we're now back onto that same trajectory of, uh, of, of uh, emitting more and more greenhouse gases. Another thing that you can do in your daily life is eat more fruit and veg and eat less meat and dairy. Um, so that's one of the biggest things that you can do in your life is change your diet. If you're consuming a lot of meat, just eating a little bit less and, and consuming less dairy um, has a large climate change impact. So if you're if you're willing to become vegan or vegetarian, so much the better. But if you're not, you lots of people aren't willing to make that once in a lifetime decision. I'm never going to eat meat or dairy again. Everybody can make a difference by eating less, not having meat and dairy in every meal, by reducing portion sizes um, and just uh, eating less by having, uh, for example, a few meals each week or a few days each week where where you omit meat and dairy and focus on more fruit and veg. And it's better for our health as well, not just for the planet. Uh, one of my big bug bugbears, having lots of stuff around the place, and never throwing anything out, is to not buy stuff we don't need and to make things last longer. This could have a big impact. Um, our consumerism is driving greenhouse gas emissions, not here necessarily, but elsewhere in the world. Uh, so our throwaway culture and our must have, uh, must have the latest technology isn't helping uh, the planet. You can use less energy by turning down the thermostat. You can insulate your home, um, which has a, a, a great impact on, on reducing your energy bills as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you can move to renewable energy to heat your homes. So when your boiler needs replacing, for example, you maybe can't afford to do, to do it just off on a whim, but when your boiler needs replacing, it's worth going that extra mile 
and to replace it with a, for example, an electric heat pump, which, which will have much lower emissions. And if you've got the purchasing power, um, uh, also um, purchase green, uh, low greenhouse gas alternatives. So things like electric cars uh, are much better for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions um, and importantly, smaller cars. There's been a trend towards bigger and bigger cars, SUVs, Chelsea tractors, whatever you like to call them, which are large and uh, satisfy the ego, but they're not very, very, they're not very good for the climate because they emit lots of greenhouse gases. So having a smaller car is better. And we can also create some carbon sinks. I'm going to return to that in a moment. So I'm just going to spend a little more time now talking about dietary change and giving you some of the evidence and also some of the evidence on how we can change land use in Scotland um, to try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So let's start with the diet. Firstly, um, a quarter of all our uh, global emissions of greenhouse gases come from food. So 26% of uh, emissions uh, come from food. In fact, if we include all the other things, such, such as the transport, refrigeration, the food system is responsible for over 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Of those emissions from food, over half come from animal products, despite occupying a relatively, relatively small share of the uh, protein and the calories and the, and the mass of food that we eat, they're responsible for 58% of all greenhouse gas emissions from the food system. And of those animal products, about half of those are from beef and lamb alone. So by reducing our meat and dairy consumption, we can have a really significant impact on uh, our own personal climate footprint. I'll give you a couple of examples. So here's ruminant meat, for example, which is shown over here on the left of the graph in pink. Uh, these are the greenhouse gas emissions in kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of product. And you can see that it's many times higher uh, from the ruminant meats, many times higher than the white meats, the pork and poultry, and those are many times higher than the plant-based proteins. So if we shift our diets from position A over here, a high proportion of um, ruminant meat, towards B, a higher proportion of fruit and veg, we can greatly reduce the climate footprint. That's because ruminant meat in particular has a climate impact that's about 10 to 100 times greater than that of plant-based food. That's not 10% higher, that's 10 times higher or 100 times higher in the worst case. So this is a real massive impact that you can have in your everyday lives to eat less meat and dairy and more fruit and veg. Here's an example of the greenhouse gas, uh, the relative difference um, in the greenhouse gas footprint of different diets. The vegan diet is 40% to 50% less greenhouse gas emissions than the uh, typical diet. Vegetarian diet is much, uh, also much reduced, maybe about 30% less than your average diet. Mediterranean diet also reduces it a bit and reducing meat can also have an impact, maybe up to about 10% uh, reduction in emissions. So vegan diets have the lowest climate impact than vegetarian diets, but all reductions in meat and dairy can deliver climate benefits. So if you wanna make a difference, consider eating less meat and dairy. But it's not only the climate change impact that is so much greater for ruminant meat or for animal products. If we have a look at this graph, these are the impacts on climate change, land use, energy, air quality and water quality. So you can see for all of these metrics, the ruminant meat performs up to 10 to 100 times worse than the plant-based foods in all of these metrics. So in the amount of land that's used, the amount of energy consumed, the impacts on air quality and the impacts on water quality. So you're not only helping um, uh, by reducing your meat consumption, you're not only helping the climate, you're also freeing up land and freeing up water and improving air and water quality. So can we use the land that's freed, if we eat less meat and dairy, can we use that to, um, to free up that land, to use it for other things like um, uh, tackling climate change. Well, over 30% of the crops that are grown on the planet are fed to livestock rather than humans. So that's over 30% of the land that we could be using to feed ourselves. 
So eating less meat and dairy would free up land to use uh, for other things like protected biodiversity or tackling climate change. And this works because when plants grow, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's the most important greenhouse gas, as I've described. And when they absorb that um, carbon dioxide, um, they lock it up in a form um, that is not in the atmosphere um, and they store it away for years to decades. So the land can therefore be used to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and help to tackle climate change. It's one of those so-called negative emissions technologies. So nature-based solutions like protecting wetlands and peatlands, restoring graded peat degraded peatlands and woodlands, better managing our woodlands and soils and creating new native woodland is really good for biodiversity and can help us to address climate change at the same time. So it makes sense to invest in a better form of better form of agriculture, a better form of a better food system and to use some of the land that's freed through these improvements for nature based solutions. Nature based solutions um, can be um, a really important um, uh, uh, tool in our arsenal to tackle climate change. So the emission reduction potential of um, improving our peatlands, planting new woodlands, restoring degraded peatlands and forests and coastal marine systems and better managing our woodlands can be up to 500 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year um, just in the UK alone by 2050. So that's a significant, uh, a significant um, uh, 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 technology that we can use to tackle climate change. But some words of caution, the land can't do it all. There's not enough land to soak up emissions from all the other sectors like transport, energy generation, aviation. So we can't just say it's okay, we'll plant more trees and we can go on with business as usual. We need immediate and aggressive action across all sectors of the economy if we're to meet our net zero targets. And the other thing is that not all land-based solutions are necessarily good for biodiversity. Um, if you think about planting uh, production forestry, um, like conifers, like uh, Sitka spruce, that is not so good for biodiversity as planting native woodlands. So they need to be chosen carefully and implemented carefully so that we can get the multiple benefits, both for biodiversity and for climate change. Only in that way are they truly nature-based solutions. But if implemented, if implemented carefully, um, nature-based solutions are good for biodiversity, good for people, and good for climate change adaptation and mitigation. But obviously this needs to be fair to citizens, especially disadvantaged groups, and to the farmers and land managers who, who are gonna be asking to change practices and to change the way potentially that they make their livelihoods. And we need to help them in a just transition um, towards a net zero future. So what's needed? I think EU exit gives us the opportunity to rethink how we will reward landowners for good management that is beneficial for climate change. Um, we're out of the EU now and we're out of the common agricultural policy, which means that we no longer need to pay farmers just for having the land or, for, um, or, to, or to produce food uh, for which there's no market. So we can rethink how we reward landowners to, to take care of the land and to provide stewardship of the land for the benefit of biodiversity and climate. The workforce needed to implement nature-based solutions in the rural environment is insufficient in number, skills and training to deliver nature-based solutions at the pace required to achieve net zero by 2045. So we're in a position now where the, the COVID-19 economic recovery package, which we all agree that we need, needs to offer opportunities to invest in rural low carbon jobs for a green recovery that delivers net zero by 2040. So let's not try and recover in the same way as we were. Let's not go back to the industries that uh, were emitting the greenhouse gases. Let's invest in new industries and new jobs and green jobs for a brighter future. Here's some examples. Um, over on the left, this is the green recovery leveling up through nature by the Green, green Alliance, which came out a couple of months ago. Uh, this is looking at the labour market challenge, so where, where there's the most challenge in the labour market. And these are the, um, the woodland creation opportunities, the seagrass opportunities and the bog restoration opportunities, which are shown on these maps. And you can see they quite often overlap 
with the areas that have the, the highest labor market challenge. So WIPI can create jobs in these areas to uh, uh, support these nature-based solutions. We can create good, sustainable jobs for the future. And just an example, um, these are the uh, a total of uh, uh, nearly 200,000 jobs uh, 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 were, were available in the nature-based um, sectors in 2016. And here's an example from the Ken, Ken Goms Connect project. Um, which looks at the direct jobs um, created by nature-based solutions and the supporting jobs, for example, in hospitality, tourism, recreation, and management and support activities. It creates all, all sorts of jobs in the rural economy. So we could use, use our economic recovery package to invest in these green jobs, which would also help rural, sustainable rural livelihoods to be developed, and would also allow us to hit our net zero targets. Right, I'd like to finish now with a, a short video. Um, yeah, I'm just about on time. I'd like to finish with a short video um, that just summarizes some of the individual things um, that everyone can do in their everyday lives. This is something that we put together in our local community, a small community um, in, in rural Aberdeenshire. Uh, we're, we're working towards net zero ourselves as a small community. And one of the talented people who does uh, videos and design in our community use some figures um, that are available um, to, to show, put this video together to show what can be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the individual level. I'll just play this video and then I'll finish off. very much so i would urge you if you would like to take up the challenge to also cut a ton in 21 the year 2021 thank you i'll leave it there the first question uh is uh, from somebody uh brian allen who's asking uh about whether we might flip 
much faster uh, than is predicted. Is it possible that there'll be a catastrophic flip in one of the next few years, never mind a decade or two? Yeah, so that, that's a possibility. So uh, that little risk diagram that I showed that was between uh, yellow and purple, um, the one on the extreme right was the risk of these large scale discontinuities. So that would be things like slowing down of the um, of the flow of uh, warm water from the Gulf Stream uh, to our shores, which would plunge us into much colder conditions. So that's one of them. The other ones are uh, methane hydrates being released from uh, the seafloor as the Arctic warms and also the release of carbon from permafrost. So these are so-called tipping points because that's when we, we go from a gradual climate change, which is bad enough, to um, uh, positive feedback loops between climate change causing more greenhouse gas re emissions released, uh, which causes more climate change and then more greenhouse gas gases to be released. So we get into that downward spiral of increasing climate change. So there is a very real risk of that. And the more, the higher the temperature increase we are willing to accept, the higher the risk of those discontinuities occurring. That's why the global community set the targets at two degrees Celsius as a bare minimum uh, with, a, with, a, with an effort to try to limit uh, warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's thought that that's unlikely if we can stay within those limits. If we push much above those limits, then we're in uncharted territory and those discontinuities could happen. Good question. Okay. Another question about the potential of ge genetically engineering crops uh, to make them fix carbon more. Uh, is that something you think might be feasible and yep. useful in Scotland? Yeah, there are a few people, there's a few people doing work on this using either traditional um, genetic modification um, and also CRISPR technologies. CRISPR technologies just remove genes, they don't put any foreign DNA into the material. So there, there's, there's work going on in both of those. Um, there's a, a, an institute called the Salk Institute in California, which is doing work into breeding crops which have uh, deeper, deeper roots which are more difficult to break down, so they don't decompose as easily. So that's another way of um, improving crops so that they, um, they actually sequester more carbon, so that they store more carbon. I should say that there's, there's no big appetite for genetic modification in Scotland, in the UK and in the EU. In fact, it's banned in the EU. So whilst that may have a role in some parts of the world, I don't think anytime soon it's going to have a big role to play here. So I think we have to do the best with the, the tools that we've currently got available and the crops that we've currently got. Um, another question about the net zero target for Scotland by 2045. Is that realistic and, and is it anyway too late? Um, it, it won't be too late. If, if everybody were to meet net zero by around about mid-century, it would be potentially, it would keep us within that two degree limit especially have, if we have some negative emissions, some removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's a delicate balance between what's, what's possible. The, the, 2050, the 2050 target in the UK and the 2045 target in Scotland is already massively, massively ambitious. If you look at what we've got to do to get there, you know, in the space of only, only you know, uh, three decades, what was it, 2020, yeah, 23, uh, in three decades, We've got to totally transform our society. Um, so I think it could go quicker, uh, but and we should aim for uh, net net neutral net net zero before 2045 if we can. But we have to balance it with between what's realistic. If it's too unrealistic, I fear that um, uh, the public and politicians will say, "Well, we've missed our targets. It's too late. We can't do anything about it." So it has to stretch us, but it has to be achievable. Uh, a few people have been asking uh, about the size of the human population and human population growth, uh, which is something you you didn't mention. Uh, yeah, it always comes. Yeah, it always comes up that one. Um, that it's true that the consumption is driven by individuals, and the more individuals we have on the planet, the more we emit greenhouse gases to feed to feed that consumption. 
Um, but we know that the best way to deal with that um, to, is, to, is to raise people out of poverty. So I'm not an epidemiologist I'm not, or a population specialist, but I talk to people who are, and they tell me that, that women's education, um, improving the livelihoods and in raising people out of poverty, people have more kids than they need because they need people to look after them when they're older and, they, and when a number of your children are likely to die, you tend to have more. So there's a good correlation, an excellent correlation, in fact, by raising people out of poverty and a falling birth rate. So the best thing we can do is tackle poverty, uh, particularly in the least developed countries. That's the best way that we can tackle uh, tackle population rise. It's projected to be um, around about um, uh, nine to 10 billion people by 2050. And we're projected to have maybe 12 billion, but that is that is then leveling off by 2100. So that with the trajectory of uh, people coming out of poverty, that should take care of itself, but we can't be complacent. But it's probably probably best not to have draconian laws like a one child policy like China did mm. a few years ago. It's better to do that by raising people out of poverty. Um, a question about governments and, and their willingness, for example, to redesign cities. Uh, as, there's a mention of cities which have been redesigned to discourage short car journeys, for example. And the question is, do you think Scottish politicians are serious enough uh, about the climate emergency to take those kind of steps? Well, I hope so. Um, the Climate Change Assembly Scotland reported recently, and there were some really far reaching recommendations just from uh, members of the public. So the, the jury or, or the, the, the uh, the committee was selected, ran, well, not randomly, was selected um, uh, to represent all sectors of the community from all geographical regions. Um, and they reported back to the Scottish government recently. And, and they're, they're, they're basically saying the people are telling the government, you're not going fast enough and you're not doing enough. And we want you to do more. I think that was a, a, great, a great example of the people telling government to get a move on and to, to, to put their foot on it and to, to show more ambition. Um, you know, I was worried that it was going to be <laughs> that, that it wouldn't come up with these sort of radical solutions. But I think they really they really told the government that they need to step on it. There are also some questions about, for example, the high price of electricity relative to gas and heat pumps and so on. Um, and uh, do you think the government could intervene more to to balance these costs and also to promote things like district heating systems and so on. Yeah, I think it has to. Yeah, so district heating system is good for good for large, um, you know, for densely populated areas. But I think there also has to be some rebalancing. You know, gas. If you consider the the environment of damage that fossil fuels co cause, that's not included in the price of gas. So if we had a carbon price, a carbon price on all products that would push gas much more expensive and it would make elect electricity much cheaper. So I think that those, those are the sorts of things that we need to be looking at um, to, to provide the incentives um, for, for these things to happen. Also providing, um, you know, providing a government grant scheme, which allows people to switch to heat pumps or other forms when, when it's coming up for time re re renewing their gas boilers or for rural properties, um, Re, re, um, renewing their oil boilers um, uh, to subsidise um, fitting of heat pumps. So I think that's got to be the way to go. Yeah, and, and there are other questions about the need for incentives and the inbuilt resistance of many people to change. Uh, yeah. And, and what, you know, do you think incentives will work and what might they be? Incentives will work. Uh, money always talks. If something's more expensive, people are less willing to do it. Um, but if 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 you come if it comes up to the time to replace your gas boiler, and your gas boiler it costs um, one thousand five hundred pounds to replace it, if there's a government subsidy that makes it much cheaper to install a heat pump, uh, including sort of retrofitting your radiators if that needs to be done and such like, then that's going to be the option that people choose. So the government has to put its money where its mouth is and spend some of that money um, that it's got committed to reducing our climate change impact on making it easier for us to make the changes. 
I mm. tried to show in the video and in, in the in the in the talk the things that we can make changes in our everyday life. But some of those were big ticket items like changing your boiler, insulation, changing your car to electric, those sort of decisions that you only make every few years, every five or ten years, they have to be incentivized as well. Okay. Now there's also a question about the potential conflict, not necessarily just uh, in Scotland or even the UK, but of clearing forests in order to grow more plant-based food products. Uh, yes, that's a good one. That comes up quite often as well. So it's it's easy to eat. Uh, I, I don't eat meat and dairy now for climate change reasons. I gave up dairy last year as well because I, I was talking about it enough. I thought it's about time I put my money where my mouth is. So there's a lot of things you can buy. So I don't buy almond milk, for example, because almond milk is imported from um, from California or wherever it's produced. And um, they use lots of pesticides and uh, uh, the, the bees are moved around to, to fertilize the almonds and such like. I tend to buy oat milk, partly because I prefer the flavor and partly because you can grow it in temperate climates and you don't have such a big climate impact. So there is a big climate impact of soya, especially when it's from South America. And there's a big climate impact, for example, of oil palm if it's from Southeast Asia. So you have to be careful in what you choose because uh, a vegan or vegetarian diet doesn't necessarily mean it's more sustainable or better for the planet. But it doesn't mean that we need to grow more vegetables. As I mentioned in the talk, 30% of all the food we grow on the planet is fed to livestock so rather than humans. And then we eat the livestock. It would be much more efficient to use that land to grow food for human consumption and then we wouldn't need to expand the agricultural area at all we could do it all on that that land that was currently used for producing feed, feed for livestock mm. there's a question about uh work, working from home uh, a couple of questions along these lines that you know you you were saying work from home if you can but of course in a country like scotland where it's cold in winter oh, yeah. individuals all heating their own home is not necessarily going to save energy yeah that's um, a, that's a really good point yeah so that's a fairly broad brush thing which balances out the home heating um against the transport costs so it tends to work out on average better but it's much better to work at home in the in the summer when you don't heat your home than it is in the winter that that benefit is is much more eroded in the winter where you're having to to heat your homes so that's that's a really good point and uh, one that i should have brought out in the talk good one um and and staying with scotland for the moment uh the land ownership in scotland of course a high proportion of the land is owned by a small number of people and uh we may cover some of this in our next talk also uh but is that land ownership a barrier to nature-based solutions? It could be a barrier or it could be a benefit if you look at it in one way. If with, with relatively few landowners, um, there are fewer people to persuade that it's a good idea, especially if there's money to be made. So if the, if the system of subsidy of, of farming and land ownership and land use um, converts to one where you were rewarded for doing something that's beneficial for the climate. Um, large areas of unforested land could be reforested, large areas of degraded peatlands could be restored, and there would be grants available for that. So mm -hmm. actually, potentially, those landowners could make money from doing nature-based solutions. And the fact that you've only got a few people, uh, relatively few people, to persuade to do that could make it easier. So there's, I'm in no way making excuses for the land ownership in Scotland, you know, there are many other things wrong with it. But from a climate change perspective, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, be a barrier. And, and still with Scotland, um, questions about whether we can actually produce enough electricity to power houses and homes, and also some of the housing stock in Scotland, especially the tenements, are, are not really suited to having individual heat pumps or anything like that. So, you know, what do you think about electricity production capacity and also the ability to heat these kind of homes uh, yeah. with renewables? It's a good question. So I think um, uh, we, the grid will cope. We'll be able to produce enough 
electricity. I, I, I've no doubt about that. But the point about tenements is, is an important one. Uh, district heating in, in those densely populated areas may be a better option. Um, renewably generated um, uh, 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 district heating systems rather than individual heat pumps may be a better solution. I think um, that's something which, um, which the large urban areas in Scotland need to consider. It's something that, you know, there's a couple of examples in Edinburgh I know about, probably some in Glasgow that I know less about, um, but that needs to needs to continue to, to develop rapidly, I think, over the next decade. Hmm. Um, the graph that you showed, uh, or the graphic that you showed of opportunities um, in Scotland for peat bog restoration, there seemed, you seem to imply there were none. In Scotland, they were all in the north of England. Uh, oh, yeah. So that was the that was the analysis that was done uh, for the uh, the Green Alliance, which didn't include Scottish data for that particular one. Oh, okay. I no, did it's not that because we have got quite a lot of. We've got the greatest potential because we have the most peatlands, and about eighty percent of them are in less than perfect condition. So we've got a massive opportunity there with peatland restoration, and in fact, the peatland Act action program, which is administered through. Nature Scott, with funding from the Scottish Government, um, is is desperately trying to ramp up the peatland restoration. I think mm -hmm. we could we could be a demonstrator for the world. I'm hoping that COP26 will be will be the will be the place where we can show off we, what we can do in our natural ecosystems, not just through planting trees, but also mm -hmm. through through peatland restoration. And and then uh, someone else raises the issue that further development of oil fields that we don't want, for example, at Campbell. Uh, is this going to delay the rapid reduction in emissions? Yeah, in my opinion, yes. I think I think we 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 need to we need to support the oil and gas industry in transitioning away from fossil fuels. So we're probably going to need some some geological carbon capture and storage. And the oil and gas industry have all the knowledge and the skills and the technology and the infrastructure to do that. So if we're going to use CCS, we have to convert the oil and gas industry from one that digs fossil fuel out of the ground for us uh, to one that puts fossil CO2 back into the ground for us. It's probably still, they've made money out of us um, by selling us oil, by digging up the oil, and now they're going to make money out of us probably by uh, being paid to put CO2 back underground. But we, we definitely shouldn't be exploring new gas fields and we should be, well, the North Sea is over mature as you know already. Um, mm. So that that should be it should be should be managed decline and decommissioning. And then there are also questions about potential feedback loops, you know, associated with loss of sea ice, uh, release of wetland methane and yep. subsea hydrates. I guess even the flipping of the Gulf Stream for us uh, in Scotland. How serious are these risks? Yeah, so that's similar to the first question. So there yes. are serious risks, but they tend to kick in. A, uh, they're projected to say we don't have any certainty, but they're projected to kick in at higher degrees of warming. So if we miss the two degree target and we move to something like three degrees, then we, we're, we're in serious risk of at least some of these positive feedback effects kicking in. And then we're in a really dangerous situation of runaway climate change, where climate change feeds losses of greenhouse gases which feeds more climate change and so on and so forth. Um, so we really must avoid that at all costs. And, and staying with, you know, feedback loops and so on, or, or how, you know, things can become circular. If one person is asking if, if we use trees to capture CO2, do we risk the run, the, the risk, do we increase the risk of fires, wildfires releasing that back into the atmosphere too quickly? We do. So, so that's if, if that were uh, a fuel for wildfire um, and that was not managed by putting in fire breaks, for example, black, badly planned forestry can burn. Um, it's probably it's probably not going to be as severe here um, as it would be, for example, in California. But we've seen some forests in California that were planted specifically to sequester carbon and the, the offsets were sold. Um, the carbon offsets were sold and now those carbon offsets have gone up in smoke and all that CO2 is back up in the atmosphere. So we really do have to be careful about how we implement nature-based solutions to make sure that, that we, we're, we, we manage that risk of reversal. That's the same for soil carbon as well. 
And, and a question about individual responsibility relative to government responsibility. And, uh, you know, you have emphasized that we can do things as individuals. Presumably, you don't mean we let the government off the hook. Uh, no, no, absolutely not. No, no, we, we hold the government to account and we get them to create the enabling conditions which allow us to make the necessary changes. So if we're going to have to have electric cars, which we probably are with, from the sale of petrol and diesel cars and even hybrids is going to be banned in 2030 at least. So we're going to have electric cars. We need to have reliable charging points. We, it needs to be affordable. Um, it, we, need to, we need to have all the infrastructure in place to do that. So that's that. the government has to create the enabling conditions so that we can make those choices. So I was just emphasizing individual choices because quite often people feel helpless about climate change. They feel like it's out of their hands or that it's somebody else's problem. I'm not trying to, to, to suggest that we do, we do it all and we let the government off doing anything. I'm suggesting that we have, the government has to act and we have to act, everybody has to act because this is gonna be extremely challenging. and We don't have time to muck about, we've got to get on with it. Coming back to, uh... Scotland in particular and the land use practices and so on, um, linking that to fires, there's a question about Muirburn and how big is that as uh, in terms of carbon emissions contributing to and should it, people claim it's carbon neutral, is that true? Yeah, so some people say that the carbon that's absorbed during the growth of the heather um, is then just released to the atmosphere. So in that respect, it's carbon neutral. Um, but the other way of looking at it is if you didn't burn that, then the carbon would stay uh, locked up in the vegetation. So it would be carbon negative. So the fact that it's carbon neutral is nothing to boast about. It could be carbon negative. The other issue that's difficult about Muirburn is that when, when the heather is burned, it creates more recalcitrant material. So that, that um, burned material, that char, is um, less decomposable. So it has been argued that by creating a burned material that sticks around for longer, you're actually sequestering carbon from the atmosphere for longer. And the jury is still out on that, I think. Um, but generally speaking, um, we should be aiming to restore our peatlands to full functionality. And uh, that means re-wetting them and allowing the growth of particularly of sphagnum moss um, and burning um, burning grouse, uh, grouse moors, for example, is not consistent with that aim. So I, sh I would say that if you had to prioritise one thing, it wouldn't be Muir Burn, it would be the restoration of those people to their former glory. Okay, and sticking with land use in Scotland, um, questions been raised about hill sheep farming, and you mentioned ruminants were a particular problem. Uh, what alternative use would there be for that kind of very rough grazing that's used for sheep? Yeah, well, it, it used to contain trees. So when the Caledonian forest was there, it was sequestering carbon. So um, you've obviously got to consider the social justice and equity issues associated with that, because many people farming sheep in the uplands are just about making a living. So you've got to consider how we incentivize if we're going to move away from upland sheep farming, which I think we we'll probably need to do to some extent. We have to make sure that there are, are uh, the, the people uh, involved in those communities. You know, I, I gave a talk similar to this once at the Scottish government and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you know, what you're saying there about sheep farming could be the highland clearances all over again. And that's, you know, we don't want to have, you know, yes. we don't yes. want to drive, drive the people off the land. We want to give them alternative sources of income, uh, sources of income and alternative ways that they can provide stewardship for the land that gives them, gives them, uh, gives them a, a source of living that is not producing something that's ultimately damaging for the environment. Um, coming back to food and diet and so on, there's a question about fish. Uh, uh, I guess this would apply to both marine and fresh water fish. Uh, how, where do they feature in terms of, you know, being good or bad or carbon costly? 
yeah. and are there particular so, groups of fish that are better than others? Yeah, so the, the answer about the groups of fish is that I don't know, um, um, but fish are another form of livestock, particularly um, uh, aquaculture. They're not ruminants, so they don't produce methane in the same way. So they're not going to be as, as uh, per unit of product, uh, per kilogram of fish or per kilogram of meat, they're not going to have the same climate impact as ruminant meat, but they do have a climate impact. And we know the trawl fish, um, bottom trawl fish especially, um, have a, an environmental impact that goes beyond climate change. Uh, it also includes disturbing the seabed, for, which is bad for biodiversity. And for anybody who's seen the Sea Spiracy movie, um, I'm sure you're already aware of that, that mm -hmm. um, fish may seem like the obvious choice if you're moving away from, moving away from uh, 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 land animal meat, um, but, but it's not without its costs. And then there's a question about quality of life um, and, and whether the changes we need to make would reduce our quality of life or could we do it in such a way that we could maintain it? I think, I think so. I think we could do it in a way that maintained or improved it. So um, that was one of, the, one of the suggestions that came out of the Climate Change Assembly was to move away from using GDP growth as our indicator of well-being. Of the, of, of the way that how well Scotland is doing is measured by its GDP growth and to move towards a measure that measured human happiness and well-being and you know ultimately I don't know I don't know what the what the meaning of life is apart from 42 but we all want to be happy and it's not necessarily it's not necessarily best for the planet or for the individual uh, to just keep on chasing economic economic growth uh, which is unsustainably predicated on the use of, uh, of, of the unsustainable use of resources. So that discussion that discussion has been had by the climate by the uh, by the climate assembly, and one of the recommendations was to government uh, was to start looking at other ways to measure um, how we are performing as a country, how well we're doing as a country, shouldn't be measured just by GDP growth, but by some measure of happiness and well-being. And there are, are a few questions about the potential conflicts in use of land. Um, for example, draining peat bogs to plant trees or growing biofuels for electricity and creating a monoculture and so on. How, what uh, processes do we have in place in Scotland in particular to try to arrive at a balance between these potential conflicts? Yeah, I don't I don't think it's good enough at the moment. Um, so there are good ways and bad ways of doing doing everything. So draining a draining a peat um, to plant it with trees is a disaster for the for biodiversity and a disaster for climate change because the emissions from the, the drained peatland far outweigh those that far outweigh the carbon that you're getting getting into the trees. So that makes no sense whatsoever. The same the same could be true of bio. Uh, monoculture biofuels or even monoculture production forestry but I think it's not really so much um, what we do it's how we do it so it's you know there are different ways of doing it and we have to ensure that you know if we're going to going to use bioenergy crops and we're going to need some production forestry because part of the our climate change ambitions means that we we need to use more timber and reduce the amount of steel and concrete that we use in building. So if we do that, we're going to need production forestry. So what we have to do is make sure that that's integrated in a sustainably managed landscape so that we not just got big blocks of monoculture going for hundreds and hundreds of miles so that we can mix that with other with other species and other forms of multifunctional land use so that we're not locked into this sort of, um, you know, a particularly bad area for biodiversity which is only used for forestry and another area which is used for something else you know we need multifunctional landscapes which are mm. integrated and and we could do that much better in scotland in the uk as a whole in fact a number of people are pointing out that uh, we, we talked for example about home heating uh, but increasingly people are concerned about cooling their homes as well uh, faced with hot weather. Obviously, in some parts of the world, that's a huge problem and probably more energy is expended on air conditioning than on heating. 
Um, I'll tie that to a question about international cooperation. How do we get countries to cooperate together, whether it's heat they need or cooling or whatever? Do you think that at the forthcoming conference, there'll be enough will to cooperate to try and achieve the targets that we need, but that means implementing them as well. I know. So that's the issue, isn't it? I think I think everybody is, has signed up to it. So 196 countries signed up to it. The US was out, but now it's back in again. So we got 196 again. So that's just about all the all the countries in the world, including the poorest and those that have the least ability to 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 adapt to climate change. So everybody's on board. But the, the critical thing will be um, turning those promises into action. Re a really important thing was to allow the countries to make their own commitments through their nationally determined contributions and not to have a top down. Uh, the G20 says that you must do this, uh, but to allow the countries to offer their own ambition from the bottom up. That was really important. But most mm. of the mitigation, most of the most of the, the rising climate change is happening in developing countries. So we in the global north have to have to. It's been agreed that there has to be a flow of finance from the global north to the global south to allow this transition to happen, to allow the, the countries there to leapfrog the dirty technologies that we use to grow rich so that they can grow and prosper without using those dirty and emitting technologies. And that's going to need a flow of finance. And that's something that has to be tackled in, in Glasgow. It failed in the last one, which was uh, was meant to be in Chile, wasn't it, or Peru, but then it was held in Madrid. And that, that there failed to be a breakthrough on that. So I think that will be one of the, the, key, um, the key measures of success. Is, has, Glasgow, has Glasgow been a successful conference? Will be if there's an agreement on that flow of finance. And that's, that, I think, will be one of the key outcomes. There's also a question. Uh, we're, we're, we've got loads of questions still, Pete, but we're not going to have time uh, for many more. But one question is about the process whereby the Scottish government is obtaining its information and consulting with experts like yourself, for example, and others. Are, are those processes satisfactory? Is the Scottish government consulting widely enough? I think so. I think it's pretty good. So it's done the it's done the uh, climate change assembly, um, which was a good thing to get the get the views of the people or a selected group of people. You know, with, it was stratified so that there was all socioeconomic groups and all um, uh, gender and uh, ethnic diversity and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, were represented within that. So it's doing it's doing its best to listen, and it does consult. With um, so as I as you mentioned at the beginning, I'm the science director of Climate Exchange. That's uh, um, that's a, a body, an independent body, which provides advice to government on on climate change issues. It also listens to the independent UK Committee on Climate Change, which also sets its targets for emission reduction and such like. So it's pretty good at engaging in Scotland because we're a relatively small country. Um, there's a good link between government. There are few level, fewer levels of bureaucracy in between the people doing the science who know about it and the people making the decisions. So that's an advantage living in a, in a smaller country like Scotland compared to the government in Westminster when there's many more levels of bureaucracy between the, the, the decision makers and the scientists. So I think we've got an advantage in that respect in Scotland. Do you think there are uh, another question about some countries that seem not to be really on board, like Australia, perhaps, and and Poland? Uh, is it going to be possible to pull those countries in? Um, I don't know. I think under the current leadership in those governments, um, maybe not. But we can see how rapidly that can change. So, so Trump's gone, thank goodness. And we've got Biden in now, and Biden has made his net zero commitment for 2050. So governments come and go, um, but long-term commitments um, remain. So they can be they can be pushed back on, um, but but when a change in government happens, then it, we can gradually edge forward. Even if we have a few governments who aren't pulling in the same direction, Canada a few years ago was in that in that um, that particular bracket of people who were pulling in the wrong direction, 
and then Trudeau got in and, and it came back into the fold. And I've just given them another example. Um, uh, Hungary and Poland are another example of, uh, and Jair Bolsonaro, of course, in Brazil, who are, um, who are not overly keen on the, on the process, but they will be gone at some stage. Okay, well, it's approaching nine o'clock and I'm sorry, uh, I think uh, we have to get to let Pete uh, finish up, uh, but before I just uh, thank him, Pete, there are a lot of people have been asking uh, two things. One, uh, which I can tell them the answer to, can they replay this talk? And yes, uh, it will be available on uh, the Philosophical Society website in due course, so you will be able eventually uh, to watch it again. Uh, some people have been asking uh, the little video that you showed is that, you know, they're obviously interested in perhaps looking at that again, showing it maybe to their own communities and so on. Is that available yes, anywhere? It's, it's on Facebook and it's on YouTube. Um, I don't have the link here. I think I put the link in at the ed at the end of the talk. So if you play back the uh, playback the recording, you should see the link at the end. But if you look for um, Sea Change, uh, Slains and Colliston, which I'll put in the chat now, you should be able to find it on that on that website. Okay, well, I'm sorry, apologies to everybody. There were detailed questions about electric cars and so on that I, uh, I thought you uh, probably wouldn't have time to deal with, but there is a lot of information about that out there. I'm sorry we didn't get through everybody's questions, but we got through as many as we can. And Pete, that was really a great talk. Uh, covered lots of ground and, and also told us what we could do as individuals, which is important, but also uh, what governments need to do for us and, and so on. And, and while it's, of course, a somewhat depressing topic, uh, hope is not yet lost, I hope. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, Pete, and, and a big round of applause from everybody. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you just can't hear it. So thank you very much. And we'll just end the webinar there. My pleasure. Thank you, Pat. Bye.